Reading from The Gun Rights War by Neil Knox, page 138. This is in section three. This section is called The Los Angeles Legacy, dated May 10th, 1992. Nothing else could better demonstrate that the police can't and sometimes won't be able to protect the honest citizenry than the L.A. riots and the, pu and the public noticed. The night the riots began, L.A. Police Chief Robert Gates was asked why the police didn't stop the half-hour near-fatal beating of truck driver Reginald Dennehy. Reginald Denny. A horrible event which I and much of the rest of the nation saw live on TV. Gates shrugged. There are going to be situations where people are going to, to go without assistance. That's just the facts of life. It was also a fact of life that uninsured storekeepers of all colors, but particularly clearly targeted Koreans, either shot in, shot it out with rioters and looters, or saw their property destroyed and their employees beaten or killed. I've talked with a 60-ish black woman who defended her building with the 15-shot Beretta 92F, a Korean gun store manager whose employees fired some 200 rounds with half a dozen guns, including a Mossberg 500B and a Colt Sporter AR-15, and a white aerospace worker who helped defend his condo with an AK-47. Every one of these models has been declared an assault weapon by various laws. Not, by, not one of those people felt overgunned. Several pro-gun activists, including the aerospace worker, told me their friends and co-workers, many of whom had previously decided, previously derided them for defending private firearms ownership, said, okay, now I'm on your side. What kind of gun should I buy? Thousands who bought guns were outraged with their businesses and apartments under attack, that they had to wait 15 days for the purchase of any type of firearm, eagle even to legally buy or borrow one from another individual. California lawmakers who enacted the Connolly waiting bill, waiting period bill, already nervous about the political impact of redistributing or restricting about the political impact of restricting, are talking about ramming through an instant check substitute law. The dumbest comment by any national politician came from Democratic political candidate Bill Clinton. In ticking off what he would do about the L.A. riots, he called for a passage of the Brady seven-day handgun waiting period bill, California laws 15 days on all guns, and the Deconcini Assault Weapons Bill banning future sales of 14 models. California Robert Ruse law bans sale and reg unregistered possession of almost 100 models. Gun owners, even law enforcement officers, were prohibited from buying ammunition by Sheriff Sherman Block and the L.A. County supervisors. For a time, dealers were even told they couldn't release previously purchased guns to persons who had gone through the background check and 15-day wait. Barry Kahn of B&B Sales in North Hollywood told me there was a near riot of law-abiding citizens, including police officers, when the 200 to 300 customers jammed in his store were told by sheriff's deputies that they couldn't buy any ammunition. Barry said he has over a 1,000 prepaid gun in his holding area, most of them purchased by what used to be ultra-left wing pacifist anti-gun pro-gun control types who have come to the realization that law enforcement personnel are not always able to be there to defend them. According to CBS News, while the run-of-the-mill looters were stealing stereos, TV sets, and microwaves, LA's organized gangs were focusing on gun shops. I was told by a previously reliable source that at Western Surplus, where over 1,100 guns were stolen, a gang leader stood on a counter conducting a military-style firearms issue. Each person holding a long and orderly line of looters, each person in a long, orderly line of looters was required to give his name and gang affiliation and was presented with a gun. Anyone who was not a gang member was chased out of the store. 
What is known for certain is that on May 6th, the feuding Bloods and Crips gangs declared a truce between each other and declared open season on LAPD. This could be the beginning of a long, hot summer, as the riotous middle 1960s were called. Something else that is certain, as made evident by radio talk show callers and even national public radio, the L.A. riots have resulted in a tremendous number of first-time gun owners and will be gun owners, and the gun control cause has suffered a serious attack. The next section that starts on page 140 is titled, Sad, Wonderful Great Britain. It's dated June 22, 1993. I've just returned from an eye-opening trip to England and Scotland. For several days, the British newspapers have been reporting a threefold increase in gun crime in the past decade, and senior police officials are muttering about the need for additional gun laws in a nation whose gun owners can see, scarcely breathe without police permission. If I needed anything to fire up my enthusiasm for the right to protect our own precious right to own and use firearms, this trip has provided it. There had never been a case of a legally owned semi-auto military-style rifle being used in violent crime before a lunatic named somebody killed 13 people with, well, Michael Ryan, Ryan killed 13 people with one in the peaceful country village uh, of Hungerford in 1987. As a result of his act, with utter disregard for facts, statistics, logic, and reason, the Thatcher government rammed through a repressive new series of gun laws which forced respected citizens to surrender thousands of self-loading competition and hunting rifles for token payments, which gave the police even more arbitrary powers to deny the ownership of any firearm, which brought even break open shotguns within the ever tightening coils of Britain's gun control anaconda. The fact that what Ryan did had never happened before made no difference, nor did the fact that he had an illegally owned Thompson submachine gun and less exotic guns with which he could have done the evil deed during a several hour rampage. The fact that the some kind the same kinds of things happen in legislatures of the U.S. and across the rest of the free world is one of the main reasons I went to England to meet with and learn from, if possible, to help our compatriots with having, while having a tremendous time. NRA President Bob Corman was chiefly responsible having traveled to Australia last fall to broaden the dialogue with members of the Australian Shooting Sports Council, whom representative has attended the NRA last two annual meetings. Bob, who conducted some 30 press interviews during his stay, was welcomed to Australia by a newspaper report that he and his wife had slipped into the country the previous day with a boatload of guns, and we in the States think our press is bad. Last fall, during the Palma match at Raton, New Mexico, John de Havilland, chairman of the British NRA, invited Bob to a select three-member team of not necessarily your best shooters, which is how I qualified, for an informal, an informal competition on the Isle, Isle of Islay off the southwest coast of Scotland. The ranges would be 1,500 yards to one and a half miles and a 20 by 12 foot metal target with a four foot bowl. Using 762 by 57, a 308 cartridge, the Brits, the Brits kept adjusting the rules so that we colonialists, George, George Tubb, John, or Jim Carlson, and I, with the help from our wives, won by four points after three days of competition using their rifles, ammo, and coaching. Mainly, we shot with veneer sights and two and a half or two times diopters in the classic Creedmoor back position except for George, who cobbled a prone sling into Michael Davis's rifle and shot a range record 40 by 50 at 2,640 2, yards in a strong crosswind, including the ringing bulls as the Scottish gamekeeper sang out over the radio. Whatever that means. We were hosted at Dunlist, the fabulous, beautifully restored castle-like Scottish estate of Piffa, 
Schroeder, a charming and accomplished member of the British rifle team. Sadly, Bob Corman had to cancel when his wife Helen became ill. The last afternoon, in excellent conditions, after the competition was over, my wife and I each shot 39s at 1,800 yards. Then the Brit's armorer, Scotsman Martin Brown, fired his last 10 rounds into an incredible 64 by 20 inch group that scored 47 out of 50 with the seven ringing bulls, four in a row almost touching just above the center pin. This entire trip, including that extreme range shooting, calling two marauder red deer stags with a 7x57 Rigby at Dunnellist, shooting a fine hussy and hussy double on sporting clays and a Webley Fosbury automatic revolver on the famed Bisley shooting grounds, and meeting with the many British firearms group has been unforgettable. And like every trip out of the United States, it has made me deeply appreciate the legacy the drafters of the Second Amendment left up to us to protect. Thank you for supporting our projects. If you'd like to buy us a cup of coffee, check out our Patreon channel. The guys and gals at gunwebsites.com encourage you to take a CCW class every year Practice at least once a month and carry every day. Thank you for watching gunwebsites.com. Do 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 do.